Hello, Adam. Doesn't sound like you can hear me. That is not good. So. Adam, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello. <clears throat> I think I, I can hear you, Keith. Hi. Okay, good. Uh, good morning. <laughs> yes, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, no, thank you for having I, me. I hope you've had your breakfast and some coffee. Mm -hmm. but it's oh, yeah. It's not. It's not. It's not early here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's okay. Let me see. I'm going to just add people. Um, they can hear us, and I'm just going to add them, and you know, so that there's a sort of feeling of having a seminar, like a big table with a whole lot of yep, people. That'd around. be great. Thank and you. they won't all. You'll see names, but you won't see video. I'm just going to. Okay. I'm just. Adding you, in, I hope people can hear me. I'm just adding you um, around the table as if there was a table. And then I'm going to allow the participants in the seminar to actually show a video if they want to. Hi, Keith. Hello, who's speaking? Is that you, Mark? Yeah. How's it going? Yeah, I know it's not, it's well, it's end times, you know. What can yes, I say? exactly. Other than that, though. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> there really isn't much else, really. It's <laughs> yeah, yes. uh, cool. So uh, great to be Sorry, here. Sorry, Mark, how are you? Where are you in Canada? Uh, yeah, we uh, we got repatriated from uh, we were in Johannesburg and then uh, the Canadian government arranged the flight, so we. We got home and quarantine and yeah, we're just hanging out now. I'm just, um, what I'm doing now, this, uh, in addition to, I'm just making some people look panelists. So, uh, if you just like to draw your attention to me, me to your, uh, we'll do that. Stephen, where are you? This is at max here. Uh, what's this one? Mark, you need to mute yourself there. Meeting. Uh, Meeting. How's it, Stephen? Fine, and you? Hello, Adam. Hi. You would have got oh. an email from G from Jeff Ely, courtesy of my uh, intercession. intervention. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you did. I did. Yeah. Good. <laughs> That's what. That is what triggered me into finally. Responding to Keith's very kind entreaties. Excellent. I, I, I'm very grateful to Jeff for doing that. So, yep. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so there are people, please forgive me, in the seminar group who I haven't promoted to panelists. Just, um, yeah, Max, I see you. Um, anyone else? Now I'm going to add you to this group. Keith, will you explain to me a little bit about um, your setup here? It looks really interesting. I will. I will. I'll. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll this, I think we need a second person actually to do some of the introducing. Okay. So the can everybody hear me? Adam, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I think we should start, and I'll begin with a. Uh, introduction and thanks to Adam, and then explain a little bit of what this involves. So <clears throat> thank you very much. Adam uh, is a historian based at Columbia, who trained unusually as an economist as an undergraduate, uh, and writes in a very unusual combination of um, what, what we could almost call, almost call kind of foreign policy style economic history. So it's very shaped by states' interests and their conflicts, which is unusual. Um, and he's the author of four books or five books, depending on how you want to look at it, including the, the most important one, I think, is probably the first one, which we haven't yet read, but we promise we will. And then we'll make, we'll make uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lobbying group amongst the historians pushing in that direction. 
Uh, and, and most importantly, Adam is the author of a, of a big study of the economic crises that have taken place since the last, 2008 called Crashed, which we've been reading in the political economy seminar, which is a voluntary reading group that brings together um, people from four or five different centers at WITS. And the centers are, they're all kind of thematically different. So one is a public administration center, uh, one is a sociology of work and actually after work it's called SWAP, but it's really preoccupied with the question of what to do with society after large scale industrial employment, which was such a big feature of apartheid. You know, the end of the 60s, everybody had work, it was very low paid work. And, and ever since then industrial work has been getting, being better paid, but much, there's much less of it around. Um, and then there's the history workshop, which is modeled on the old, on the British history workshop on the, on the um, and there are several other institutes. The, the, we have a lot of people from the University of Johannesburg, which is a different university, but very closely twinned. And the academics are quite close, they're friends. It's a bit like NYU in Columbia with most, with, but the institutions compete. Um, uh, and so this is a kind of voluntary group. Uh, and we have been reading for a long time, three or four years. And it, it's mixed in, it has two really important problems. The one is what the hell has happened to the economy globally? What the hell has happened to capitalism? Uh, how is it so different from the capitalism we, we learned about when we were students? Um, and, and the second question is, is really about corruption and its effects on institutions in South Africa. So we've read a lot about comparative, and they can be closely linked, these things. A lot of African political economy is, is about why is it that the corruption has such devastating effects here, where it seems to be a great enabler, actually, of industrial development, economic progress in other places. So, yeah, I think that sums it up. Uh, WISER, which is the institute that I'm based in, is an interdisciplinary center with a large number of people, 30 or 40 people, directed by uh, Sarah Knuckle. Very strong interdisciplinary focus. So there are people who work in philosophy, uh, in English literature, uh, anthropology, it's, and it's, you know, we can, the nice thing about WISE is we can host almost any discussion. I think the real plus of this pandemic is it's, you know, given us real flexibility about how we go about doing that. So we can bring you here to us and this audience that you've got, there will be around a hundred people. It's very strongly South African. But there are a few people who work on South Africa who, but, but this is a, you're talking to a, a kind of South African social science audience here, I would say is probably the best way to capture this, of broadly interdisciplinary, lots of sociologists, geographers, anthropologists, and then other people in humanities, historians, and English literature. So thank you, Adam. Um, I'm gonna post to the chat the list of the questions. We've already sent Adam a list of questions and then ask the people who drafted each of those questions to speak to them and then, and. We'll see how stilted that is. I hope it will be it will be quite engaging. Shall we proceed with that? Carl, that means that you're up next. I hope your kit is all in good order. Uh, yeah, fine. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, I see our, our reading group has expanded somewhat this afternoon. A little. Um, so it's great to have you. Uh, I want to echo Keith, Adam. It's great to have you with us and to be talking about that magnificent book that you wrote and that is so riveting to read. Um, so my question is about the relation between politics and uh, the global financial system. And what comes through so clearly in your book is the mismatch between those one fully globalized system of finance and then these various national politics um, and how particularly at, at, uh, in the US and the EU, the nas national level politics and domestic peculiarities prevented any adequate response to the financial crisis, the crash of 2008, 2009, or the series of crises that followed. So the result was that the Federal Reserve and towards the end of the Eurozone crisis, the European Central Bank were forced to come to rescue with the very blunt monetary instruments at their disposal. So there's three questions that I want to pose that arise out of that. Firstly, what would a more adequate set of national political responses look like? 
Your book seems to hint that dramatic fiscal stimulus, which could have been more targeted towards the general citizenry uh, rather than the, the oligarchs and plutocrats, and particularly the poor, as perhaps happened in China, would have been the most productive response. Is that your view? The second question is, how could national politics be transformed so as to get a better grip on the global financial system and its ongoing crises? Could I envisage something like um, uh, national regulation, capital controls in short, to re-anchor financial markets within the nation state? Or could it be through some kind of internationalization of politics? And then the third question is, you know, finally, the net results of central bank stimulus throughout the decade of crises that you write about um, has been to, to uh, produce a series of very large bubbles in financial markets, taken together with the massive bubble in, bubbles in China around debt-driven debt -driven, um, investment. So all of this suggests that the recovery since 2008, 2009 is very, very precarious. Add to that the financial system interventions of the central banks during the current pandemic, and surely we have an unmanage unmanageable ballooning of financial crises globally, of financial bubbles globally. Is this the case? And, and if it is, what are the future prospects for economic recovery and growth? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, does it, can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me well? Great. Um, well, can I start by saying uh, what a great pleasure it is uh, to be part of this conversation? Um, how delighted I am that that you've that you know taken the time to read this huge book and. Uh, Thank you, Carl, for saying that <laughs> you don't find it too much too much of a trying experience. So, um, well, you know, um, thank you very much for that compliment. Uh, one of the very few good things to come out of this crisis, I think, is our realization that we do have the technology to do this kind of event. You know, every day of the week, and I kind of kicked myself that we weren't doing it much more extensively before the crisis because this was actually available and has been available for some time. Um, so it's wonderful and, and I'd be delighted to be in conversation with you as a group in a more sustained way. So um, I'm, I'm, um, Keith and I were talking ahead of time uh, about possibilities for that and I'd be, I'd be more, than, more, than, uh, more than welcome that opportunity. Um, I know it's an interdisciplinary group um, and I should start by just saying that I truly am, despite my training in economics as a young person, um, a historian. And I don't say this in a defensive way, but I think that has certain implications for my approach to the topic and also my ability to answer the kind of questions that Carl has asked, mm -hmm. which were strongly normative, policy orientated, what should we do? And I wouldn't, you know, it would be absurd um, mm -hmm. to sort of pretend that if you write a book like Crash, you don't expect people to ask you that question. And it would be absurd mm -hmm. to suggest that I don't have you know, in my head answers to that kind of question. Um, but again and again, because I've since writing it, being engaged in lots of conversations like that, I have realized that there's a sort of, there is, there is a sort of, uh, well, you might call it a professional deformation, if you like, in the sense that, that that isn't necessarily where my mind immediately goes. Or perhaps I should just simply say, I never feel I have very good answers of that type. Um, and I should just say that, you know, up front. Um, and I think it's also worth saying that, that though my politics is clearly of a critical variety, um, it's informed by, uh, I was recently rereading Ulrich Beck's Risk Society from 1986, and I can't help recognizing the extent to which I feel the product of that particular moment of critical political, critical theory. Um, so that will go to the answer I'm gonna give, I think to Carl's third part, the third part of his question. Um, yes, I mean, absolutely. You know, the first question is, you know, could there have been a more adequate response? Would it have consisted in a larger fiscal policy? Would it have been better if that fiscal policy had been targeted at low income groups? Um, I think yes, 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 obviously. Yes, that's clearly the answer. And we are in some sense, I think, seeing some, you know, this ugly phrase policy learning in the current moment. There has been a much more rapid fiscal response historically it's quite surprising how large it's been. And sort of sociologically and in terms of political science, it's rather, 
um, it's genuinely surprising how quickly it's come because our general idea is that fiscal policy lags monetary policy, which is why monetary policy in a rather functionalist way has acquired the role of the first responder. And now what we've actually seen is a very dramatic fiscal response of various types in the current crisis. That in a sense amplifies then I think the critique of 2008 because it's clearly possible to do very large scale fiscal response and not just in places like China. Um, and that opportunity was in various ways missed. And then of course the story of austerity is a protracted one. So even in Europe, in the Eurozone, in 08-09, there was in fact a fiscal response. Um, the real damage is done in the aftermath. The real damage is done after 2010. So one has to think, I think, of fiscal politics as a protracted game. And the real, the real question is, as it were, how do you grind through this? Um, but yeah, one of the shocks for me of writing the book was discovering the scale of Chinese action and its impact. And I think that comes through also in the way in which that chapter is written. And it is intended, I'm obviously not a China specialist, I've put that there in a sense as a foil for arguments about the West, which I know much more about. But it seemed crucial to have it there as part of the story. And I think as we have digested the history of 08 going forward, and as of course, as the balance in global political economy has shifted progressively ever more towards China, not only are we all scrambling to find out more, but I think also moments like that take on a new historical significance in retrospect, because Beijing did things there which are harbingers of subsequent action. Though, in fact, there are other interesting questions to be asked about why they're not repeating that experiment mm. in 2020. So that's apropos of the first bit. Containing, containing finance at a national level, one can see the attractions of that strategy. Um, um, I'm skeptical about it only to the extent that we have to reckon with the genuine scale of global finance. And I think we need, to, we need to understand two different dimensions of it. One is, as it were, its power to negatively impact weak players in the global system, which is huge. You know, take your pick of any number of uh, cases. But then if you actually look, as it were, there's a paper I thought we might discuss in the next session that we had, you know, earmarked, like, if you actually look at the, the balance of global finance, not from the point of view of the, its victims, if you like, which is obviously a legitimate and highly important perspective, but if you just look at, as it were, where the trillions are put that have to be put somewhere, if you're BlackRock, they're actually in places which already are, to a very considerable extent, under the influence of national governmental agencies. In other words, you basically have to put them in one of the US Treasury market, the Bank of Japan managed Japanese treasury market or in some form of eurozone asset because there's really nothing else to put them in. I mean, the Chinese are developing their market. So that would add a fourth and all of those are already to a very considerable extent under the influence of national authorities. You know, it's a complete, is one of the, as it were, a sort of abiding myths of the current moment that the nation state does not already. It's just which nation states play what kind of role and the key central nation, the powerful advanced economy nation states have a huge degree of autonomy relative to financial markets as they demonstrated in 0809 and they're demonstrating again now because you know the Fed expanded its balance sheet in two, three weeks by the size of the total portfolio of BlackRock. So you know again if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the question I think from the point of view of that's, you know, it's used that euphemism of emerging markets is, is, is what the viability of that kind of national strategy is at that level. Um, and there's a whole series of rather interesting developments there, which were already pre present in the crash narrative, where I was trying to highlight the fiscal agency of emerging market actors that has become ever more present now. Um, and we've seen a really quite dramatically creative response on the part of significant, a significant number of EM um, um, entities. Uh, states in, in relation to the, the current crisis. Um, I, 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 obviously, this is, these were huge and very powerful questions and we should just kind of, we, we will, I feel, come back to them over and over again in the course of, I've seen the course of the subsequent questions, but this is just an opening gambit from my side. The, the third question is as the sort of, is Carl's, well, hang on, if this is true, doesn't that mean that this is a cumulatively, progressively more dangerous system with ever greater crisis tendencies? To which my risk, this is where my real sort of historian's impulse comes in. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what this is. I think if you're, you're of a reformist or interventionist or 
sort of political science bent. It's like from that it follows that something must occur or from that it follows that surely we must be advocating or clearly all clear thinking people must recognize that this must change because, as Carl's saying, to which my, to which my response is no, I don't think that does follow. And my vision of the narrative of modernity or capitalism would be that it's precisely that, right? An ever more astonishingly dangerous balancing act of ever larger proportions involving 7.8 billion people in ever greater scales of entanglement with ever greater risks of really catastrophic things going wrong on an absolutely huge scale and more and more knife ends decisions and more or more more and more fundamental questions about the structure. So both as it were structure and agency coming under increasing pressure, you know, and as a historian of the 20th century, you know, for me, the first moment is not economic, but it's 1914 and the decision-making processes that lead to World War One. And again, it wouldn't be economic even in the age of the Anthropocene because I would point to the hydrogen bomb and the development of the nuclear standoff as precise. Well, you know, does that look sensible or, you know, look like, no, it, it's, a, it's a highly dangerous, escalating second modernity, right? That's what we, and so my, my premise is not that we would necessarily back down from that, but that my, gam, my guess is that all of the major interests in the world are basically just going to increase the, you know, we're raising the stakes progressively. Right. Does that suggest the scale of crisis could be even larger progressively? I mean, evidently, yeah, that would be my, that would be my, and if you read, you know, on, on the narrative offered by Crashed, um, that implies, you know, ever greater stresses on the political systems and the decision making processes of key actors in this system. And we may, you know, living in the United States right now, we may be witnessing the decomposition of one of those key actors before our eyes on a virtually mm, hourly mm, basis. Mm, mm. So I, I, yes, I think that's a correct reading and um, it doesn't make me necessarily um, fatalistic because obviously the book is really a critique of agency or the lack of political agency in key respects. Um, but I certainly agree that there is that crisis tendency. Mm, it's a great start. Great, yeah. <clears throat> mm, thanks. Faisal, can you, I think, I think you're here, but I can't see you. Keith, can you tell me how long, so I can calibrate the length of my answers in light of the formidable list of questions that you've piled up, how long, how long should we assume we're going for? I think it would so be, I, I envisage these questions will take us about 50 minutes. 50, uh, okay, yeah, cool. So I'll be more, I'll be slightly more measured in my response then, because Carl's there are great. There are new ones. One's come the piling up too. Uh, so I, so I, will, I will make, I will make slightly, you'll forgive me if I give slightly more stenographic responses and then we can see how it goes. So. Mm, great. Faisa, you were here, but I think you may have gone. No, she's there. Hi, Adam. And uh, as everyone said, thank you for joining us. Um, so my question is about um, control and predictability and the, and moving away from the boundedness of the national economy. Um, and I think that in particular, the issue of the Keynesian multiplier effect, um, which presumes that a, a given amount of government spending will have a particular, um, it will have a quantifiable um, stimulus in the national economy. Um, and I think if we're moving away from that in an era of globalized financial flows, um, I think that the stimulus is lost when money can easily um, exit and leave the country. But given that we are in a situation of globalized and interconnected financial flows, is it still possible to predict the effect of central bank policies, and particularly from the United States and Europe, um, or predict the global effect of, of these policies? Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's a there's a, I can't actually even remember whether I cited it in Crash because it's such a sort of wonky passage. It should of course be said that like part of, part of the price, I mean, it's a book published with Penguin. So it was written to be read by a wider audience. Part of the price of that is that an awful lot of stuff which, you know, tickles my wonkish fantasy gets cut. And there's a particularly brilliant BIS 
Bank of International Settlements working paper, which goes exactly to Faiz's point, which is where, they, where they, they basically describe themselves standing before a kind of fuzzy black and white television of the global financial system, where it's just not working and they can't figure out where. And the response appears to be basically, much as you're suggesting, Faiz, just to hit it with a hammer, right? Because you don't, you know, no, you have no hope, really. They literally say that the flows of money no longer map onto um, the econometri econometrically specified general equilibrium models they're using, which generally speaking operate still rather surprisingly within national boundaries. And so none of the aggregates that they've charted actually corresponds to national income categories. And so it, also, it certainly operates at the global level, <laughs> but it's very difficult at this stage, and this was a paper from 2007, um, it's not clear how you break that down to the to the national level. And I think that's a very interesting observation about financial flows. And as we saw within the North Atlantic system, it genuinely wasn't possible to safely disentangle the balance sheet of Deutsche Bank from the robustness of the American financial uh, balance sheet. But I think there's a series of points I would make in relation to that. And that, of course, also you know, corresponds to our general understanding of how globalization works. I mean, ever since the, really, I think since the 1970s, there has been a persistent critique of the efficacy of the nation state in light of globalization. In fact, you could take it back, of course, to the classic era of imperialism before 1914. You could already see Hobson and Lenin saying something a little bit like this. But anyway, for the last half century, it's been a standing idea, an idee fix. And it captures certain realities, but and, and especially from the point of view of small countries, from the point of view of small in the sense of their economic weight, especially small countries which are open financially or have been opened financially or where certain elites consider it in their interest to be tightly bolted. Under all of those circumstances, your story, I think, is really, is really quite valid. Um, but I think one should make like a series of sort of cascading qualifications. The first is that it is really a choice, right? How the Americans chose not to regulate Deutsche Bank constituted the problem for the Fed. And they have totally changed their approach since 2008 because they realized basically that Deutsche Bank had not been required to onshore, Barclays neither, any capital in the United States. There was basically no regulatory thing for them to have any purchase on. And that made Deutsche Bank and Barclays very dangerous for the American monetary authority. Mm. So what they've subsequently required them to do is to onshore capital within the US. Now, any actor in the system can do this. It's a question of your bargaining power, whether or not the bank can, thinks it's worth its while doing this. And certain actors have more powers than others, but we shouldn't underestimate how much power you know, worthwhile markets do have in this respect, right? We shouldn't, as it were, hand the game to global capital up front by saying we all know teleologically this is the way this is going. So, therefore, it's a question of probing the limits. The second thing I would say is that we really have to be quite careful about whether we're talking about fiscal or monetary policy. Much of the argument in Crashed is really driven by the dynamics of financial balance sheets. The story that you're invoking, Faizu, is really that of a Keynesian multiplier. That's a fiscal policy story, and the logic there is somewhat different, right? Nothing is quite as slippery as global banking balance sheets. Um, and a, a big plea I would make is, is, is for the differentiation of different modes of global interconnectedness, um, of which the financial level will be the one that most subverts the ability of nation state actors through their choice, they helped create this system or certain bits of state apparatuses from the 50s onwards chose to make this. The UK Treasury, the US Treasury basically constructed this system, even within Bretton Woods. That has then subsequently escaped their grip. But on the other hand, fiscal policy, which operates through national taxing authorities and national spending authorities, is subject to this at the limit. If you are a very small, very open economy, like the Netherlands, for instance, it just can't operate an independent fiscal policy um, because it's, it's people can literally just get in a car and go to Belgium or go to France or go to Germany and buy their groceries there. You can't really operate a national fiscal policy there. For a country the size of the United States, which has like a trade openness of India, I mean, I'm not kidding, like it's something like add up imports and exports as a share of US GDP, which is the maximal measure. And it's like 20 to 25%. If you look at what, you know, when America spends a dollar on something that comes from China, quote, unquote, it's a little bit like, forgive the flippant comparison, but it's a little bit like Ghanaian peasants and cocoa beans, like something like five to 10 cents of every dollar an American spends in a big box store on something from China actually goes to China. Most mm -hmm. of it actually stays within the United States. 
So is America disabled from operating fiscal policy by the globalization of its economy? Absolutely not. And no sensibly sized entity in the global economy at this point. South Africa clearly isn't, the Eurozone as a whole clearly isn't, none of the large players within the Eurozone are. There will be some leakage and there is definitely therefore an argument for coordination at large regional level at least. But again, we shouldn't hand the argument to, as it were, you know, globalization is very easily can serve as a kind of, um, you know, a, a mode of, mode of sell. This, this discourse can serve as a way to disempower political actors. And we should just be clear about where it does and where it doesn't. Fiscal policy yet, not quite. Monetary policy, bank stabilization, it may genuinely need large scale global coordination to make that work. <coughs> Um, yeah, yeah, yeah it's me up. So the, one of the, as you say at the beginning, one of the things that's really astonishing about this book is um, its treatment of China. It's, it's very interesting because, you know, it, it places the kind of global geopolitics into the story of financialization. Uh, so you wrote a lot on Russia and, and, and an enormous amount on Germany, actually. I think the Germans, we have this debate about who the villains are in the story and the Bavarians come across as the villains, I think, but that's not my question. The question is really what to make of this Chinese, these two interventions that you described, one in chapter 10, which is about a 50% a of GDP increase, I think you said in fiscal policy. So this is basically, it's spending. It's fiscal monetary. monetary. It's a combination of private and public. But, but, but it's not only that they, you know, they, they're not, it's not just a question of making the money available. It's the way in which the different levels of the state, really down to local government, basically yeah. adopt the enthusiasm of the center and measure everything they're doing and, and basically busily get about, go about looking for the money and spending it. And it's that capacity, it's a kind of administrative or bureaucratic capacity that seems to me to be missing from the debate. So if you read Skidelsky, it's still, we've got to go back to, got to go back to Keynes or get back to fiscal policy. In South Africa, I think we very, some of us, and there was a debate in this group, but some of, we, we're very skeptical of fiscal interventions, having any ability to shape the economy because we, we miss, we doubt basically our bureaucracy and we fear the looting would, that would come with that. So I wonder how we, how you, what you make of that uh, mm -hmm. and what the implications are for this debate and for really the future of democracy, I think, because that's really what's behind this problem. Mm. Um, and the second thing is to say a little about what you think the, the lessons of the 2015 crisis are for the Chinese. Because yeah. it's, you know, you, the side, you can explain what happens, but essentially, you know, they momentarily are subjected to the same kinds of what we call extroversion, offshoring crisis, where the, where the people who possess capital flee and take their money with them in an absolutely staggering scale and speed. So, yeah, no, I think this is um, it's one of those one of those moments that I mean we all have. You know, you you, suddenly, you read something which really shakes your understanding of the world, and it was something as banal as the Economist magazine's January 2016 write up of what had happened in the following year. Part of the problem as a historian of writing this kind of contemporary history is that you spend so much time thinking about what happened two years ago or three years ago that you are actually following what happened. You know, at that moment, even though it's your job and that's where your book's going to end up finishing. And I had not, I'd been paying attention to Ukraine. I'd been paying attention to the Greek crisis. I'd been paying attention to the refugee crisis. I had not checked the scale of the shock that the Chinese economy had suffered in 15. And, and, um, and, and furthermore, what just really, I'm still, not, I, I know Sharon asked a great question about it. I'm still, as it were, sort of struggling with this. And I think this is, as it were, one of the predicaments of our moment is that there was the Economist magazine celebrating in glowing terms the glorious success of China's authoritarian regime in restabilizing the Chinese economy uh, the previous year by means of what? By means of, well, targeted interventions in financial markets, a, a, a fiscal policy push, but also the reintroduction of capital controls. Now, this is sort of, no, this is mind-boggling at a technical level that The Economist magazine, which is obviously one of the outriders of neoliberalism, should be celebrating capital controls for anything, let alone that they effectively were crucial in saving the global economy. But, but, but that what this implies in a more general sense is that, as it were, the fate of large-scale global capital accumulation hinges on the ability of China's regime to maintain its grip. Um, 
And when things get, when we have an emerging market, quote unquote, as large as China, and we've never, of course, had that situation before, it turns out that the standard neoliberal prescriptions are, will be downright dangerous. And like the last thing anyth anyone wants to see is the Chinese actually lifting their capital control. Now, that's dizzying because, you know, much as Westerners, when they observed Nazi Germany in the 1930s, imagined that, as it were, there were factions within that regime that were more or less liberal, more or less predisposed to the West. And of course, similar was true, no doubt, in their handling of apartheid South Africa as well. And that you, as it were, engaged in various forms of, of engagement with those different factions with a view to manipulating the internal power balance. It had long been an article of faith that the people in the People's Bank of China who were most in favor of liberalizing the current account were our Chinese. They were the Western orientated, liberal, reforming. By implication, they were going to deliver the liberal teleology of convergence that we had staked everything upon geopolitically in the 1990s. In other words, safe to integrate China because, because you know, one thing leads to another, property rights, modernization, and so on. And here we had, when the chips were down, the economist basically hailing a huge retreat from that vision at its cutting edge, which is capital market integration, as pivotal to the stabilization of the global economy. And not just to sort of in general, but concretely, immediately, and thank God they did it, you know, the day before yesterday. Because, why? Because indeed, as Keith is saying, it turns out the Chinese had got themselves a capital mobility problem, and they obviously have the sociology of that in a you know, a huge group of incredible, well, a, a, you know, because it's China, it's a large group of people who are incredibly affluent and who've got lots of money that they need to move out. And Hong Kong is clearly pivotal to this, which is part of what's being played out in the entire drama around Hong Kong this right now. Um, so that I think is, you know, and we can maybe talk on another occasion or later on about the implications of that for 2020. But taking the story back to 2008, what, to my mind, as it were, that is the question, and it's the question you're asking, Keith, because you were sort of too polite to say it. But the, the transmission belt for that energy is the party. The transmission belt for the energy of the gigantic fiscal policy push of 2008 is the party. Uh, it does not run via the state apparatus. It comes via party directives, which say to everyone down to the regional level. And of course, we have to scale, right? A Chinese region is the size of South Africa. Chinese region is the size of one of the largest European states. So that basically means, as it were, from the, the imperial headquarters in Beijing down to these provincial levels, each of which are operating between 30 and 60 to 70 million people with GDPs the size of large emerging market economies act. And the transmission belt is, is, is the party apparatus. The party, of course, in now is the party tied up with developer interests, with local banking interests. It is, it is a, in liberal terms, a highly productive corruption. Um, centrally organized around the achievement of certain objectives which appear to condition your ability to go on pursuing your local side deals which enrich you and your family in, in ways which are highly productive. So, you know, a class and state formation process deeply entangled which still has the capacity, however, by means of central directive to mobilize this agency. And I think that is what does differentiate China quite distinctly from less well integrated political economies where um, you know you, you either don't have the capacity for action or if you do have the capacity for action as you peer, for folks, folks appear to fear about South Africa the money dribbles away and the money doesn't dribble away in a constructive way i.e within the local economy it dribbles away outside and so disappears um, and I think that is what I wanted to highlight I mean for me the other contrast is with Putin who use the opportunity to bang heads together within the oligarchy. So, you know, he used his authoritarian possibilities to demonstrate, to put, you know, to put the stick about and to demonstrate who was in charge of the oligarchic faction that he heads. And if you're willing to describe American politics in similar terms, the question is why people weren't willing to put the stick about and actually reorganize the oligarchy, taking a non-normative, you know, and I agree this is obviously a little bit polemical to make that strong comparison, but that was the purpose of those two contrasts was okay, so China has this agency that's rooted in the, in the one party state um, and Russia has agency rooted in the ruthless intra-oligarchic politics. And for me, the contrasts are with the relatively coherent oligarchic politics of the United States, where you can see closure, elite closure around the treasury fed uh, bipartisan nexus. 
uh, and the total incoherence of elite power in Europe, which to me is, as it were, the so those, as it were, that is the quadrilateral of comparisons that I think the book is more or less explicitly opening up. Um, and I do, of course, now, of course, the question is, what do we make of the astonishingly ideologized reading of one party power that is becoming more and more prevalent in the West with regard to China. I mean, it's literally moving the goalposts of what's possible in relation to China every single day in the US right now. It's extraordinary how deep that goes. I don't know actually how the ripples are being felt in South Africa. I know a little bit more about China's engagement with East Africa, but anyway. Mm. Um, so that is, that, that, that was the, the, you know, the kind of rhetorical purpose of that of that account, but also not to, not to fall then into a kind of simplistic, you know, celebration, Martin Jake style of the glorious agency of this, you know, because that isn't how it's understood within China itself, right? There is, there is persistent and enduring anxiety on the part of the more sophisticated actors in Beijing that they don't actually control this. Um, and one of the tests of that is going to be climate change and their ability to actually um, decarbonize their power, their, literally their, their, you know, their ESCON, like, you know, it's, th that is the question, can they do this, which is what my project was going to be about before COVID hit, I mean, that, well, as I am working on that book as well, but the, but the, and this was completely manifest, right? It was, wasn't, this was before she, so the internal self-criticism was a little bit more, a little bit more explicit, you can see the Chinese worrying about this avalanche of spending that they've unleashed. No, I'm Great. speaking for tar too long. I'm so sorry. I, I, no, will, no. I, will, I will try and be brief. Um, let me just say, we have, I think, we have six more questions. Um, okay, and I'll try, let's try and do them in... Yeah, we should try and be yeah, so, so brief. So yeah. sort of three to four minutes each. Yeah. Uh, Laura? Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hi, Hi. everyone. Hi. Hi, Adam. Thanks very much. Um, my question uh, <clears throat> is about the IMF and has quite... Um, pre pre sorry. <clears throat> quite present as concerns. Um, so, uh, but as you demonstrate in Crushed, uh, to talk about the IMF is, you know, we really have to look back um, at least to the 08 period and a little bit after that as well. And so in your account um, of the crash, the IMF is both an important player, but it also undergoes very significant changes uh, with new leverage um, on the global stage. Um, so I wanted to ask, could you, could you reflect on how the IMF shaped and but then was also was shaped by the un yeah. unfolding events of um of the period of 2008 how how contingent um was the imf's interventions or did they reflect broader yeah. kind of structural developments um, that were happening at the time thanks yeah it's a really interesting story um and it does indeed have huge enorm and enormous immediate relevance of course because i think the question that is being asked insistently is okay is 2020 going to be a similar kind of shape-shifting event in the history of the IMF and will the IMF be equipped with the resources necessary to cope with well in the spring of course we thought like immediate apocalypse across the emerging market world that doesn't seem to be the situation that we're facing now but this is a slow burning crisis and as we know the epidemic is gathering steam across the low-income world so anyway great it's a powerful question um, um, it's also worth saying that um, there isn't an audience more receptive to crash than the IMF. I have had more interaction with IMF professionals all the way up to the deputy one below Lagarde um, than any other institution. It's been quite remarkable. Um, um, so they read it as a kind of manifesto, I think, for like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's weird to be in that that situation. Um, yes, I think, you know, we too easily forget the IMF in 2007, 2007 looked like it was an institution on the way out. Um, it had essentially destroyed, burned up, and again, this is obviously a significant sign of the times, its, it's legitimacy at the global level in the Asian crises. Um, no one wanted to borrow from the IMF, so its income was depleting. We, we don't reckon with this. It has its own internal business dynamic, and if it can't make loans, it can't earn income, and it can't pay salaries, so it's shedding analysts. And people were asking the question whether we need it anymore. And for want of any alternative, it was then supercharged in 0809. It was fully integrated. If you talk to people like Tim Geithner, it's clear they fully understood the IMF as the extension. So there was core national activity, then there was Fed global intervention, and the IMF was the last resort for the weakest cases that weren't as systemically important. But it needed to be scaled up. 
So again, an important marker is you know, the IMF of the 70s, 80s, 90s is doing national programs for relatively small economies. What they're facing in 08 is a systemic meltdown of the entire financial economy. And the private bank balance sheets are simply far too big for the IMF to be a credible actor in relation to them. So they need to make the IMF into a 21st century financial actor. That means a trillion dollar balance sheet. Right? The sticker shock thing about a trillion dollars is quite important. You need to actually get to that scale before you can be talking seriously about any kind of global intervention outside the case by case emerging market low income country interventions. And so they do that. The perverse thing, of course, is that the the first big job that the IMF ends up doing is intervention in the Eurozone. A bunch of advanced economy countries which ought clearly to be able to regulate their own financial affairs. And it's that double trauma, it's this series of shots which really shape the IMF in its current configuration. If there's one thing they are not going to do again, it's an advanced economy intervention of the type they ended up doing in Greece. Like, because you know, they're still technically, well, you know, as the Greek, they, until very recently, they were on the hook for the Greek program. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of, so they, they find themselves caught between a global imperative, a legitimacy problem, technical reasons, scale. Everyone, of course, hope, well, everyone, a group of European and African leaders were pushing before the IMF spring meetings for the SDR extension. The other haunting legacy of the crisis period is the extreme politicization of the IMF on the right wing of the American Republican Party, not across the whole party, but Ted Cruz basically is the anchor of this. And he obstructed America's vote in favor of quota reform. I mean, Lagarde, I don't know whether you've seen, I mean, Lagarde engaged, engaged in humiliating like, efforts to obtain Senate approval and in the end they got it. But they, this for them is as it were the, the next marker. So I'm trying to be as brief as I'm trying, so I'm being stenographic, but as it were, they are caught between the recognition of the need to scale, the recognition of, of the need to become a truly global institution if they're going to be legitimate, in the narrow terms that we're talking about legitimacy here. So within the sphere of G20 apparatchiks legitimate. And then thirdly, the question of whether or not you can get any of this past the right wing of the GOP in the United States. So the politics are a little bit like those of climate, climate, global climate politics. There is a group, a veto group on the right wing of the US, within the US national political system that can hold this whole thing hostage. And that I think is what killed the SDR proposal in the spring. Um, because Mnuchin was just not willing to go back with the congressional GOP, given the other stuff they had on. He was not going to risk them putting their teeth into this. And so they just buried it. But, it, it. but that then implies that there is a fundamental constraint on the ability of the IMF to expand to the scale and to act on the scale that's necessary in a world in which the, the you know, so-called EMs are becoming extremely large. So the funding requirement runs to four or five trillion dollars. And the IMF doesn't have that scale right now. So this is a very, it's a long, you know, it's along with a series of other global governance issues, one in which it's not clear that they square with the, with the veto logic of American national politics. Great. The, the Europeans love it. You know, the other stakeholders love the IMF because they love um, offshoring these kind of governance issues. So hand mm -hmm. it off to the IMF is, is an easy fix for Berlin. Mm -hmm. Max. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Adam, also from me for a fantastic book. Um, so, oh, yeah. Crash manages to weave a vast amount of complexity, intricacy, and technical detail into a powerful and arresting narrative. So what I wanted to ask was about politics as a narrative strategy in the craft of that storytelling. So Crash tells a story in which apparently structural processes are in fact political. So polit politics is a crucial counterpoint to the system. What then are the parameters of politics here? At times, politics appears to refer to the dynamics and implications of engaging with national, often democratic publics. At other times, politics seems to refer to elite politicking in an international field, the contingent struggle among key actors. Bridging the two, but perhaps distinct, is an emphasis on attempts to control narratives. So for example, the, re the recurring phrase political theater and a concluding emphasis on events against structures. So does politics in fact refer to more than one thing in the crafting of the account? Or is it whatever lies outside accepted aspects of technical infrastructure and technocratic planning? So whatever remains up for debate. The question 
then is as much about storytelling as about conceptual category. What framing work is politics ultimately doing as an analytical and narrative device? And conversely, how might Crashed open up our sense of the political? That's such a great question. Uh, I've been thinking about it ever since I read it, um, uh, when Keith sent me it. Um, and I'm not going to be able to do it justice in the brevity no. of time that we're allowed, so I'd love to come back to it on some other setting. Um, but I think you're absolutely right in diagnosing that it's, as it were, this slippery term that does a lot of work, that it's absolutely central to the book. Um, the book is pitched against what I take to be misunderstandings from critiques I'm sympathetic to about where the boundary line between the structural and the political is. In other words, what I'm trying to do is to say, folks, I get it, I'm on your side, I totally agree, but you're underestimating the scope of agency. piggyback on, but are subverted by self-serving narratives of structural necessity foisted into the, onto you by your political opponents. In other words, don't accept your political opponents' accounts of what the structural constraints are. When somebody says there are bond vigilantes out there and I'm a bond vigilante, don't accept that account, right? Because look at what central banks do. So, if central banks are able to do this, then the question is, uh, why are they able to do this outside the zone of politics? So what politics was it that constituted central banks as outside the game of politics? So it's a sort of, as you say, a somewhat confused, confusing, sort of meandering through a kind of, I would think of it as a meta politics. I mean, uh, Jeff Mann's book about Keynes brings this, brings out for me in a crystalline way something that I'd been thinking about through Keynes you know for many years and Jeff like just it's just like a certain sort of liberalism or a certain to my mind a certain sort of radicalism has to has to engage precisely with the question of what it is that we deem political what for evidently power political reasons we make political and what we don't and in the Europe I mean and again you know I'm a traumatized European when I'm thinking these thoughts overwhelmingly so what I'm thinking about is the is the, is, the, is the mind fuck that the Germans laid on the Eurozone, right? That's the, that's, the, that's the thing I'm trying to get us to think constructively about. In the American case, it seems to be it's fairly transparent. Like the elite gets together to use the instruments of the states to stabilize the system very much for their own benefit, but with some, as it were, collateral positive effects for the ordinary working people, right? In the Eurozone, they don't even manage to do that. So to me, the question is, how did that happen? And what construction of the political was it that prevented the Eurozone even from arriving at that kind of cynical elite bargain, which I take the future of whatever we call this, you know, weird synthesis of democracy and capitalism to ride on is the success of all the, the effects of those kind of bargains. So that's what the, the analytic of political is doing for me is to sort of gnaw away at established boundaries. This isn't to suggest a kind of radical voluntarism with determinacy. It, but, um, you know, again, I'm a child of the 80s. It's a sort of story of structuration, the, 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 the creation, production and reproduction of structure rather than, as it were, structure as just a given. And the role of the political and the, the political and politicizing and depoliticizing of that. I mean, you know, in the previous book I wrote, Deluge, was hugely uh, influenced by an argument which was basically a triangulation between Schmidt and Keynes. And, and I, I, you know, one of my answers to you might have been a Schmittian answer, and I'm, you know, one that isn't sympathetic to Schmidt, but that basically says political is what has the intensity of the political. The question is why are certain things put in the deep freezer? Um, why is it that the intensity is removed so that they can remain? And that, and obviously, the Schmittian definition has all sorts of obvious problems, but. But there is indeed a slipperiness on that term. It does this work. It's supposed to be a kind of the effect of the book, I hope, is to is is corrosive of certainty about where those boundaries are. And if it achieves that effect, then I think you know it will have done some useful work. Um, but it is also necessarily, therefore, a politics which is experimental. In other words, we don't really know, but we should try this out. And what these crises offer us opportunities to see is what very powerful people who are empowered clearly do how they experiment when they're under pressure and the chips are down. And that's why we ought to be interested, I think, in moments like this. Um, 
And then we need to be asking ourselves the question, okay, so why were the boundaries of action you know, right from the very beginning? So when we did like Carl's question, when we did fiscal policy, why was the boundary drawn there and not somewhere else? Um, so, but I, you know, I take the force of your question, uh, absolutely. Um, but I'm delighted that you would have read it in that way because that means that it is, you know, it is, it is working in the space it's intended to work within. <clears throat> Jonathan. Thank you. Clara, not Kruger, Clara. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Um, I think this question is, and, and thanks for making yourself available for this and for more. Um, I think my question is in some ways a repeat, as you were mentioning, of Carl's, one of Carl's questions, the second yeah. one. Um, it's about state capacity, mm -hmm. um, which I think you've actually in the talk given a much more um, capacious understanding of it than you did actually in the book. Um, there you were really using it once in terms of regulation of Eurozone banking capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but my question was about the prioritization between the national and the international level. And it partly came because of a review you wrote in the New York Review of Book of Katerina Pistor's book, The Code yep. of Capital. And I think you were a little, well, I read you there as being a little unsatisfied with her lawyerly um, reforms and sort of saying lawyers should get out there and build the state. And maybe that's the US state uh, under Trump. Um, so maybe the way to put the question is, compare that effort with, you've just talked with Laura here about the IMF and the need for, I think you said a trillion injection into the balance sheet. You know, what about the administrative capacity there too? Um, so it's, it's asking that second of Carl's questions again, the balance, the investment in state capacity building between those two levels. Thanks very much. No, thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Um, the, the passage that you, the sentence that you quote is coping with highly integrated financial capitalism requires a state that is disciplined, has the capacity to act and has the will to do so. Coping with a banking crisis on the scale that was brewing in Europe required a very capable state indeed. And it's one of those sentences or two sentences that you remember writing and thinking, shit, I bet somebody's going to ask me a question about those. Um, so finally, these really are, uh, I, I really do have to thank all of you for having read so attentively because you're, um, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't elaborate it more than I, that I, that I did, and I should have perhaps elaborated it more um, because I felt that the question of um, really being more precise than I was about the state and what state capacity would mean would take me into water that I wasn't going to be able to corral into the form of the book that I was trying to write. And so the result, I agree, is a kind of slipperiness, which the full implications of which only become clear when I talk about it in the way that we currently are and we start making these comparisons. Because obviously the real question is, when you say the state capacity is, what do you mean by the state and whose capacity are you talking about? And when I say, well, I'm comparing implicitly, you know, the Chinese system or the Chinese state with the Russian state, with the Eurozone, with the United States, that's really the four state forms, if you like, or modes of government that this book is really thematizing, along with a bunch of rather competent EMs, which are quite interesting. Um, and so that is, that is one of the absolutely key themes of the book. But obviously, in each case, the capacity that we're talking about and the stateness is quite different in each case and would require you know, space for kind of conceptual comparative elaboration, which I didn't give myself in this book and I didn't think my editors would have a lot of patience for. So that's why, as it were, it's bracketed. I know that's a sort of a sort of weak answer, but I think that's really where it does. And it allows me to continuously postpone this question. Um, um, because I think clearly what we're seeing is, as it were, that, in, that it requires different types of, you know, there are different modes in which one could specify this competence. There is the more technical competence um, you know, whether or not your central bank has the right sort of people who are able to do this, who are not totally cognitively captured by the people they're regulating. So that's one set of questions. Another set of questions is whether you have the political, in the broader sense of the word, that, that uh, the previous question that was just asking, backing to act, because the ECB is a competent central bank like the Fed, but it doesn't have 
the power political backing to actually act at the moment. And in fact, it has a, it has a head, Juncker, who wants to use this moment to play power politics with other key actors. And what state is the ECB actually part of, right? So the, 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 the question rapidly spirals, you know, into, into a, whole, a huge array of very complicated issues. And then in, in the case of China, obviously we're talking about a party state, whereas I was saying that the authority, the actual power lies outside the state apparatus. And in the Russian case, what we're talking about is something that's a little bit like Frenkel, where you have, as it were, a sort of a legally bound administrative state, which one should not underestimate in modern Russia, especially the central bank has, you know, is a key functioning administrative apparatus. But then you also have what, what Frenkel would call the Maßnahmenstaat, right, the discretionary state, which is essentially Putin's ability to reach down and fuck with anyone's life, especially the big the big oligarchs, they know they're both very rich and very empowered and also incredibly vulnerable at any given moment. And that, 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 gives, that, gives, you know, that gives him leverage, which no American attorney general has over any of the major actors in the American system. Um, unless they you know, happen to have been too friendly with Jeffrey Epstein, like they're basically very difficult to touch. The, the, the Jamie Diamonds of this world, much as people clamor for some sort of judicial reckoning with the American banking oligarchy, it's actually really difficult to deliver within the framework of the American legal system. Um, and, we'll, and there's a very high risk of it backfiring. And, and the American you know, legal apparatus was basically living down the consequences of Enron and the impact on Arthur Anderson. And that's one of the major reasons why they were very unwilling to act during after 2008. So, so that, that little nugget of a formula I produced there, like, um, I'm sure it's right at some level that that is exactly what Europe needed, but spelling out what that would entail well, I think the book does the work of spelling out what it entails with regard to the Eurozone. To spell it out in more general terms, I think probably runs up against the extraordinary complexity of uneven and combined development within the, the global system, which in fact generates different types of state capacity and power in different places under very different uh, auspices right now. Yeah. I'll leave it there because we're, we're running, we're running yeah. short of time. We'll come back to this, I think. Sure. Adam, th uh, can you hear me? Is it? Yes, I can. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. Echoing thanks from everyone. Um, I'm just going to read my question. All right. Given three things, your uh, first, your work on statistics and the making of the modern national economy, your first book, which we mean to read as a group, um, as well as two, your close reading of Foucault and Foucauldians on the governmentalization slash territorialization of the economy, in the early 20th century. And three, given your caution at the beginning of Crashed, I think it's page nine, that global finance a century later requires us to give up the island model of national economies and interaction. How do you think with Foucault's tools about the evidence by the end of Crashed that makes strange bedfellows of the Fed and the Communist Party of China? How does Foucault help us understand global finance capital at a, at a time in which its politics are uncontainable in national territory. To use Foucault's metaphor, have scholars of global finance tended to cut off the king's head preemptively when undemocratic, if not monarchical institutions like the Fed and the Communist Party of China uh, are the ones that have been at the forefront of trying to regulate global finance. Uh, I'll, I'll add a little grumpy add-on about the <laughs> squaring Marx and Foucault and or thinking with the Foucault in terms in this kind of quasi-Marxist way as well. I'll leave you at that. Uh, excellent, thank you. This was another one of the questions that Keith sent me which have, have, uh, which have had me thinking ever since and um, um, I, I, in, the, in, the, in the short period of time we've got I'm not going to give you, be able to give you a thorough, if fully satisfactory answer. Um, but what, what I will say is that um, it is clearly true that we have to have a, an analytic which allows us to recognize the role of central agencies like um, the Fed. So as much as we may be sympathetic to the kind of Foucauldian critique that wants to cut off the head of the state and to, and to, to undercut that rather crude notion of power, 
we cannot, as it were, fall onto the kind of reverse salient of not recognizing centralized power when it clearly exists. And, and I obviously have a kind of professional personal deformation in this sense. And this is the thing that I end up obsessed with always. And I, I know that I'm, you know, vulnerable to criticism, but to take the analyst analysis that Crash offers at face value. And I think it's undeniable that there are key nodes in the global system that do have this kind of sway over very large parts of it. So what are we going to make of that? And, and I was wondering whether one way out might be to think in terms of different um, media within which power is organized. Perhaps, you know, and this, this would not after all be implausible, perhaps there's something about money which um, makes it preeminently um, the zone for this sort of Rather, you might say, if you forgive it, just, just kind of carriage it, kind of like an atavistic notion of sovereignty, like a rather, a rather classic primal notion of sovereignty is tied to fiat money. This is money because I, sovereign, say it's money in the limit. This is always counterposed to what is also obviously an essential part of any reasonable account of money, which is that money has value because it's, as it were, you know, classically dispersed capillary. Uh, dependent on collective trust. And so perhaps money and the credit system are a strategic place for thinking about this relationship between diffuse power in the form of ledgers, balance sheets, accounting, credit, which, you know, is, is eminently amenable to a, uh, to a, uh, a kind of, you know, the, the Foucault revision of our understanding of power. And simultaneously, the kind of ultra sovereignist uh, notion of money, uh, of, of power that resides in the central bank. I don't think I've really gotten further than thinking that, 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 that this might be the zone where we need to really reckon with that duality. Um, uh, that then causes me to begin wondering about some other zones. I mean, you know, where one might think about, say, modern military power and the duality between between atomic weapons and, you know, drones on the one side and the realities of military power and counterinsurgency operations or deep militarization of states or whatever, which... So I... I, 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 uh, I guess what I'll, what I'll say is that these crises have destabilized the confidence with which I felt I could navigate the power structure and have in a Foucauldian way and have re-alerted me to the element of contingency, of centralized power, of sovereignty in that classic sense, which is also where I was going with that final riff on 1914, which is what the book ends with, in that there is a lability a uh, inherent in in modern power that i think we have to we have to reckon with and that's that's probably as far as we should go right now on, on this moment but let's come back to it perhaps in a subsequent discussion yeah great okay so we have two questions uh, left i think john kruger and christian christian looks like you may have fallen off i hope not john i think you should proceed with speed with haste Thanks very much, uh, Adam. I think these also hark back to past questions and so on, but I hook on the statement that you made in the LRB on 16th of April that yeah. in the US, the national institutions of economic policy actually work. And I mean, to be brief about it, is this not a bit misleading in the sense that yes, you know, sort of the monetary financial market interventions were there when we needed it, uh, but really a lot of other aspects of economic policy uh, not very coherent in the U.S. And then also, could we not argue that, you know, this monetary policy is really just another case of this extend and pretend or pretend and extend that leads us on to the next crisis? And quite critical about that in the case of Europe. But here, um, it seems you think that is the characteristic of good economic policy to avert the crisis. Um, uh, okay, so so no, I mean, I take the force of your point clearly. Um, so this was this LRB post that I wrote early on in the COVID crisis, and I was drawing a contrast there, and I think I was under the impression really of the first phase of the COVID crisis, where um, um, March and early April, where it did seem as though we were going to replay the script of 
of 2008 and after. And um, the story is constantly shifting. Anyway, what are the broader stakes? Let me just spell that out. And, but um, uh, in Crash, if, if you think of the book as a, as a limited intervention in understanding the response to the heart attack of the global financial system in 2008, um, it seems to me that the point, it is reasonable to say that the, that the institutions of the American nation state, and that's an important qualifier here, provided a platform to stabilize the financial system. Do they then provide the platform for a thoroughgoing change in that financial system such that it becomes more stable? Evidently not. And the Dodd-Frank chapter is surely downbeat enough on that theme. What I point towards is an ever greater entanglement between the government agencies of government, American government in the macro prudential regulation regime. We have seen that massively confirmed. Does that imply that uh, we are, as it were, in a hamster wheel of ever greater and ever intensifying risk and ever greater need for interventions such that the interventions themselves have increasingly to be understood as essentially systemically necessary and provisioned? Absolutely yes. And I think I would just it would kind of revert back to my first answer to Carl. When I say effective, it's only really within the limited scope of that kind of a frame. In other words, are they enough to allow the hamster wheel to roll one further iteration forward? And the answer is yes. That's all we mean. Is this normatively, you know, is this what anyone would wish? Is this what how one would affect, you know, hope policy to be conducted? No. But then for me, as it were, the question is, where did we get off imagining that that was how, no, this is a theory of crisis. This is a this is a narrative of a crisis-ridden system, which which is capable of moving one step further. The implicit comparison was with the whatever the EU is, which is not yet is not a federal system, is not a nation state, and it's the national. It was the ability of the Americans and indeed the British um, to weld together in the crucial third week of March this year the agencies of the Treasury and the central bank into a single crisis fighting mechanism that is so striking because it, to go back to the previous question, reveals a hard core of sovereignty. Um, because we're gonna spend this money uh, and we're not going to brook any questions about how we finance it because ultimately we can just print it. And who prints it? Well, the central bank and the treasury between them will print it. And you don't see that very often articulated with that degree of openness, but that's essentially what the UK treasury did. Um, and that's what effectively the US Treasury is doing as well. And that, um, that's what I'm referring to. The question is whether the Eurozone as a much more disarticulated system has that capacity. That was the limited frame within which I would stick to that statement. And we are now, of course, seeing the decomposition of the American governmental machine and state apparatus before our eyes. So it hasn't lasted. And, and that has been one of the, you know, the shocks of the ongoing crisis. So all of your points are very well taken beyond that, though, in the... In the uh, you know, the, um, yeah. Thanks. So we have one more question we, from Crispian. Yes, Crispian, you're in the dark, but we can hear you, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on with my uh, camera, but I, I try to fix it. Um, so, Adam, thank you, man. You've given us an, many hours of incredible reading, and it's been fascinating because there's so many different ways that you can read Crashed, and, and one of them um, uh, is really as an anthropological study of a liberal globalist technocratic elite uh, embedded on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and you give fascinating detail about how this elite operates under a moment of intense crisis. Um, and I, I wanted to draw you out a little bit um, because you appear in Crash to give two accounts of this elite. Um, uh, the one is a sort of softer terms that this is indeed a te technocratic elite who come to the party, uh, albeit belatedly in, in, in Europe, and uh, get outmaneuvered by this, you know, resurgent populist right that's reacting to a lot of what took place in, 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 in the crisis. Um, but there's another interpretation, and you, you, you in fact quoted that advert from the Trump campaign, um, which may have been a slightly naughty quote. Uh, uh, and I have to say, you know, it reads, 
having read Crashed, I agree with the quote. It says it's a global power structure that is responsible for the economic decisions that have robbed our working class, stripped our country of its wealth and put that money into the pockets of a handful of large corporations and political entities. So, you know, there's another way of uh, judging this elite. You know, they're an in interconnected, self-serving, double-dipping, deeply conflicted group, um, epitomized by the likes of Goldman Sachs, who, you know, built the repo market, uh, uh, bet against the subprime crisis, got $13 billion from the AIG bailout. They've been highly active in the euro bond market, to whom one of their former uh, members, Mario Draghi, came to the rescue. Um, and even now in this latest crisis, I, I, I read in the news a few days ago, their global market segment uh, uh, increased headline earnings by 93%. Um, so they do well out of crises. Hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, the the... Obviously, that Trump campaign had had some nasty, racist, uh, uh, anti-Jewish sentiment behind it, which is clearly not what I'm wanting to suggest. But um, I wanted you to comment on this elite and uh, wh which of these two versions that I've put to you uh, resonates most. Hmm. Um. Well, I think they're both true, right? I mean, I don't, I don't actually, I, I, I think you're right that I'm, that I'm, um, I'm not sure whether, I, I, I totally agree that as it were, there are, I, 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 I'm hesitating to agree that there are two versions. I think it's certainly true that in the book, they're characterized both ways. By hesitation, if you mm. like, about the strong sociological reading is that very often, and this isn't always the case, but very often it's accompanied by a lack of curiosity about two things. A, as it were, what makes these people tick and do what they do, and B, an interest in the finer differences between elites which have all of those self-serving characteristics and yet are capable of organizing compromises which actually deliver benefits for the ordinary working population. And those which are either so kleptocratic that they don't, which I gather is one of the preoccupations of your group as well, or just so incompetent that they end up harming their own interests. And of course, even worse, those are people who are more vulnerable than they are. And I guess, um, you know, to be absolutely, so th th those I think, that's, that's why if you like, I, I did not in this book pursue a kind of rigorously sociological account of the actors involved um, because I wanted to leave it more open. I don't think there's anything necessary about this move. I think it's perfectly possible to imagine a highly sophisticated sociology that would preserve, you know, the subtlety of the account of, 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 the motives of the actors and would allow one to adopt the, precisely the kind of calculus of lesser evils that I think dominates my politics. But, but um, in, you know, in the process of writing it under the circumstances I was writing the book, I didn't see that, I didn't see that middle way. And, um, and it's a criticism that people have made about, you know, my, I'd say wages of destruction. You can make a similar sort of argument about, I think in the treatment of the, Nazi regime is that I sidestep, if you like, the classic Marxian question of how to characterize the ruling elite. Um, because, because I feel uncertain, if you like, of the analytical grounds on which I do that. It's, this is a, you know, all of your, you know, very probing questions are pointed to this, this somewhat, um, there's a sort of coyness analytically about certain moves the book makes with regard to politics, with regard to state capacity, with regard to this issue of class, um, that I would accept as, you know, it's a frustration that I feel myself in, you know, having finished the book is that I don't really feel 
that I that I nailed those issues as squarely as I would like to have done. It may simply be that I don't actually, my mind is in a sense not fully made up. Where I feel my mind is, mind is made up, I, like I feel I was fairly unsparing. And, th and that isn't, those aren't issues where I do. I mean, I particularly, I think, am cautious about the 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 question you're asking because I'm acutely aware of you know m not just my entanglement but 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 structurally the entanglement of, of you know all of the institutions I've had the privilege of working in for the last 10 years with precisely these people like so like I, I don't feel entitled to you know somebody invoked Fanon um like I feel I feel zero entitlement to to a sort of distance, like I'm paid a ridiculous salary by a private university that is run essentially as a giant hedge fund. And everyone in my, you know, all of my colleagues are, our students go on to work in these institutions. Um, you know, like they sit on the boards that govern our universities. You cannot be part of large scale private universities in the United States and pretend to have any real sociological distance. We are, objectively entangled um, as intellectuals that work in a rather more or less oblique relationship with this system. Um, and more interestingly, perhaps, than that, and this goes back to an earlier question, one of the wages of the book is that that system, for all its self-serving corrupt qualities, is also capable of producing thought and insight and conceptual you know, self-criticism which this book is completely parasitic on, right? So, um, you know, Nathan Tankus, you know, the, the MMT dude who's shot to prominence in the last year or so sort of paid me this backhanded compliment of saying he can't believe how radical the conclusions are given how orthodox the sources are that I draw. Mm -hmm. Whereas I take that to be like proof of, you know, that's, that is precisely, and I actually take that to be an, an authentically Marxian kind of move. Let's start mm -hmm. with, in factory inspectors reports let's start with you know the classical economists and see what at a moment of crisis this I, I agree with you corrupt entangling system is capable of seeing about itself and that the shocking thing about when you read the bis reports when you read the central bank you know when you read the plutonomy report by what who was it morgan stanley jp morgan one of these banks actually mapped their own position within this hugely entangling hierarchy of wealth that you're talking about. What can you see? And that's in a sense what Crash delivers. It doesn't draw on, um, you know, radical or heterodox political economy. It's really just saying, look, if you take the most orthodox sources from inside this system and sift them in this way, this is also a sympathy I feel for somebody like Foucault, who I think proceeds in a quite similar way. And at one point he says, you know, I'm a radical positivist. Like I take the things I find and rearrange them and then say, well, now what do we see? And what we see is people say it. I mean, you know, that, 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 so I, you see what I mean? So I don't, again, feel the righteous clarity of position. I don't feel entitled to it and I don't have it. Um, and instead what I'm doing is taking this, you know, this material and rearranging it into what I think is quite a compelling collage that is remarkably revelatory despite being drawn almost entirely from inside the apparatus right from almost entirely from inside these these materials like yeah. it discloses itself um and I, I feel at that level it's a safe position to be in whereas you know and justifiable i don't mean safe simply in a in a like uh, it's a, it, yeah it's is, can, can i found that can, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, amazingly insightful and interesting and going to be the source of a, a lot of discussion and argument, I think. So there are six people who had their hands up would like to ask questions. I think we should let them if you can Please. give us I can hang 20 on. Yeah, minutes. I know it's entirely my fault. To go thank you very session. much. So, uh, Shireen, I have you down first because you got your question in earlier. So are you still with us and can you unmute? I am still with you and hi, colleagues. Lovely to see all of you. Uh, thank you, Adam, for a great uh, discussion and a great book. My question is really, you know, sli slightly different from the, from the questions that have been asked, although perhaps it tacks a little bit onto Max and Sharad um, on the question of what is what is politics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm.
quite struck by the ways in which um, the discursive uh, quality of affect runs through the the discursive right. quality of affect. Affect, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm just making sure I heard. Affective terms in which um, you, I, I not just how you write about it, but that is ever present, I think, in uh, public decision making um, and is mobilized by you as well in, you know, in terms of panic shocks. We know that the way in which this economics has been kind of miscast uh, into a kind of technical exercise, right? When it is, mm -hmm. in fact, quite um, tied to the ways in which crisis, panic, fear, um, all, all of which the pandemic, by the way, mobilizes in space, and mm -hmm. which is so effectively mobilized by the populist mm -hmm. interventionists that you Mm -hmm. talk about. I, I wondered if you wanted to surface that uh, more explicitly in what you would say about um, the relationship for elites. Uh, that I, I personally find the kind of Naomi Klein way of talking about it far too instrumentalist, that she thinks, you know, shock doctrine is kind mm -hmm. of instrumentally mobilized. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you had a more nuanced way of thinking about the relationship between the mobilization of feelings um, mm. in economic decision making. Mm. Um, Should I respond? Should you, do you want to bundle? More. Yeah, cool. Okay. Let's say two more and then you can yeah. pull them all together. Halani, Sibia, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Um, thank you. Thank you for your patience. For allowing me to ask this question and um, good, af good evening to, to all the colleagues and thank you for this uh, great discussion that we've just had. Uh, my question is uh, around austerity budget that was mm -hmm. just announced by our Minister of Finance um, last week. And he subsequently wrote uh, quite, a, quite a good paper, uh, a good article actually in the business day that explained that um, the reason for a more austere budget as compared to an expansionary one uh, at this point in time is that the fiscal multipliers are weak in emerging markets. That is, uh, especially uh, with, with an economy that is highly indebted as ours. I just wanted to know if there is any, any other papers or any other... Um, arguments that can be put against that because the paper that uh, he presented um, it, it's only one paper and um, it you know it was not necessarily very convincing at least not to me thanks the last in this group Michelle are you still with us Michelle Williams Hi, Keith, it's Vish. Um, oh. Michelle just, just stepped out. <laughs> I'm not going to ask the question. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Okay, we'll skip you. Okay, so I think, Adam, if you can engage those two, and then we'll take the three, the last three as, as a group. Um, yes, I, I, the, 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 the question about um, affect is, 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 is just genuinely fascinating. Um, um, I, to do it to answer to answer you uh, seriously would require to really to really engage fully um, would require more reflection than I could produce right now because it takes me quite by surprise and it's it's really it's a great question but you're absolutely right that that I clearly do mobilize that rhetorically discursively in the narrative to drive the whole thing along um, it's part of, as it were, my identification with the people that I'm talking about. Um, it's part of the effectiveness of the book, insofar as it is effective. And the, you know, those who were part of it, who 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 read the book subsequently, you know, would say things like, "It made my hair stand on end. I felt sick. Like I had to put it down. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stop reading it." Like, I didn't think I was going to want to read another history. I thought I, and I don't say this in like, I, you add to my knowledge. I didn't want to go back to reading it. And then I found I couldn't put it down. 
it, it's certainly true that there are post-traumatic kind of self-help groups amongst the crisis fighters. There's a particularly large group clustered around Tim Geithner that meet every year at Yale and they have like an annual debrief and it has been clearly identity forming for a group of the people who were most close to the action in 08. Um, because it clearly was vertiginous and um, they lived in a kind of, you know, a series of really terrifying weekends. They were separated from their families for long periods of time. It was, it was clearly horrific, you know, really shocking as an experience that none of them are likely to forget. That's, you know, that's just them inside that bubble. And this isn't to talk about the wider ramifications and the increase in the suicide rate. And everything else. Um, I do think that um, there is also a way in which the crisis fighters themselves think and prepare themselves for this moment, right? So part of the kind of precautionary impulse, there is obviously, there are the vulture funds. The, the Naomi Klein story is not, is not, you know, it's not devoid of evidence. There are vulture funds out there that are profoundly frustrated by the actions of the US Fed because there isn't enough distressed debt for them to buy because you know, the Fed has made it all good. Um, there are people lugubriously sitting on the sidelines wait waiting for those opportunities. I'm not sure that it describes the state of mind of the median capitalist power holder. Um, and it certainly doesn't describe the state of mind of the teams that think of themselves as first responders that think of themselves and you know and I, I do kind of you know exploit Tim Geithner's memoirs for all their work because they are a real treasure trove of American imagery of this period and it's soaked in 9-11 aftermath they all want to basically be the firefighters that ran into the buildings this is the modern image of American heroism um, the macho dudes are the special forces guys with the huge beards and the gun toting but the you know, the, the civilian version of that is, would you have had the guts to run into one of the towers um, on 9-11? And that, I think, is, you know, that is the image that they brace themselves with. A lot could be said. It's, it's fundamental to the logic, and this bridge forms the bridge to the question about the multiplier, because, because since Keynes, at the least, you know, we've reformulated aggregate demand as an effective psychology, whether it's, you know, whether it's the psychology of the consumption function, in which we basically just assume people routinely consume a certain fraction of their income, or whether it's the more volatile psychology of animal spirits and investment. Um, but this has become absolutely central to thinking about all macroeconomic models um, with quite vertiginous implications for their structural stability, because they just basically don't have any um, if you start pushing on them, because the question, of course, is how expectations are formed. And in the Lucas critique of the 70s, expectations are formed by self-conscious actors watching themselves being modeled by modelers. So the only reasonable expectation of a psychologically self-aware investor, it has to include the modeling efforts of the external actors. Um, and I think that brings us to the question of like what multipliers are. I mean, whilst you were talking, I Googled multiplier South Africa. Wider has a study which says it's two to three, which would make it was huge. Um, the question I think I would ask is, what politics is being performed when you announce that we can't do this because the multiplier is really low. That was the game that was played out in the Eurozone. And we saw that disassembled before our eyes by the new team at the IMF under Blanchard, who just showed that they had systematically underestimated the multipliers. All of the econometrics were biased in technical ways, not, not politically biased, they were biased technically. That had produced you know, a misunderstanding under the particular circumstances of very depressed private investment expectations. The multiplier was large. <laughs> what depresses private expectations? Well, then we are back in the realm of the discursive construction, if you like, of the animal spirits of investors, which is a is palpably something that is operated on. And I'll just end with one further. You know, stress testing is that taken to its sort of technocratic limit. Let's all psych. Let's see how good we feel if we literally gut check, you know, the financial elite of the United States. Imagine if we all seriously imagined the worst case, how good would we feel about our situation? That's the, and if we can then announce that we feel fine, you know, this by itself has a, and it's difficult, it's difficult as, as, in, as sort of flimsy as that may seem, it's difficult to deny that something like that happened in the summer of 2009. And it's a crucial, crucially differentiates the American experience from the Eurozone experience. So I really think, and the, you know, one could, I think, speak 
structurally about what it is that you know that allocates certainty to the multiplier estimate that the finance minister will will invoke and consigns all of this other stuff to the realm of you know the intangible the uncertain that of which we will not speak um if we're serious people and i think i think it's um I think it's a very, very interesting question. I don't have, really have anything definitive to say about it. One last line from Strait, who obviously I disagree with on money issues, but Wolfgang Strait has a great line where he says, like, don't we need to think seriously about why the right to panic is allocated to financial markets and not to citizens? And in a sense, maybe, you know, populism is, as it were, the manipulative exploitation of that panic. Mm -hmm. Though I find it quite difficult to really think of what, the Trumpists do is panic. To be honest, I don't. That doesn't seem to be quite the right, quite the right emotion. Um, but in any case, I think the politics of emotions around this are clearly and the meta politics of, of, of crucial. Okay, we have three more questions. I just want to remind people that we're going to drag Adam back into to, uh, into Zoom on the 29th. So if you feel like you have a question hasn't been addressed, come back and we'll talk to him again. Then. And that'll have a stronger contemporary focus. So I have Bill and then Reg and then Siraj. Bill, can you unmute yourself? Me. Me. Indeed. Have you accidentally pressed the, the hand button? No, I haven't. I wasn't expecting uh, to be part of this. Uh, I'm a great admirer and fascinated, but um, I don't really have a good question. I think I'd rather wait until the next, uh, until the next uh, round. Uh, right. But of course, but of course, anything you want to say quickly in terms of the crisis of 2020 uh, and how it continues from the other uh, would be very interesting. Thanks, Bill. So, uh, um, and then Reg, your question's written down, but I think it's nice if you read it out. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Adam. Uh, what a terrific book. Interesting, interesting reading, indeed. Uh, mine is a, a short one. Um, your, your book paints a picture of... Uh, a high infrastructural power of global finance and its entanglement with high politics. Mm -hmm. Now, in cases of countries like uh, South Africa, China, and so on, where do you see democracy evolving, given that uh, the macro institutions of state are evolving with this entanglement with the infrastructural power of finance? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, effectively, the, 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 the population, if you want, the majority are not benefiting yet it's only the, uh, the, 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 the elite who are basically enjoying all these foods. Yep. Yeah. And then Suraj, you the last question. Hey. Can you hear me? He's still with us, he might have gone for dinner. Uh, he's written his question down. Shall I read it out? If you, Suraj, if you're not there? He's here. He's here. Yes. How do you know you're not with him? Where's... Uh, Doesn't seem to the mic, uh, so. I think just read it. Read the question, kid. Okay. So it's Raj's question is, why do you think that many governments ignore finance, global finance and financial flows and the domestic financial system and the financialization of their economies in their analyses and diagnoses of the problems of their economies and their solutions? For example, the South African government explains unemployment and low levels of investment by resorting to microeconomic issues with the economy, such as flexible labor markets, low skill levels, and overregulation of business. And they ignore the broader impact of the operation of domestic finance and integration into global financial systems on employment and investment. Mm -hmm. I think we'll, we will address this again, I think. So, yeah. But so, Adam, maybe you can answer those, but also sort of conclude, and then we'll let everybody go off and get a glass yeah, of yeah. wine, which you, you yeah. cannot do, but we, yeah. we are on that. Uh, well, <laughs> don't underestimate. <laughs> you know, it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> um, uh, um, so maybe maybe I'll, I'll start with the, the last question. I mean, um, I, I take it that there's, there's a there's a you know there's this appointed question, and I and I, I take your point. I mean, I think there is a a obliviousness, uh, and it's not it's not by chance. It's 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 instrumental. It serves the interests of very powerful groups who have profited handsomely from the development of 
our economic system over recent decades, um, and as it were, take you know, posits posits the development um, as natural as necessary, as as unquestioned, and then as it were, in a similar move, um, points to the you know the naturalness of labour market immobility, the the failure of teenagers to take advantage of public education. You know, and is it where we have a kind of naturalizing discourse in which the problem becomes the microeconomic issues of the labor market and not the structural development of the world economy? I, I think that's I think that's perfectly valid as a, as a criticism. Um, I quite like Keith's opening, which is also to say, and this is, I think, particularly evident in the UK case where, which is a particularly extreme case of financialization. It was also in part because no one knew the answer to Keith's question or the question that was posed by one of the groups that participate in this consortium, the one to do with industrial labor. It just was for want of any alternative. In a sense, people, there isn't a good answer to the problem of where high quality, well-paid employment is going to come from for large parts of the population. And so you grasp at straws, you grasp at alternatives, you grasp at things that do work. You you, you position yourself instrumentally and strategically in relation to them. And that's certainly what the British Labour Party did from the 1990s onwards. It's like the city works. We, they generate a lot of tax. Maybe they're not our enemies after all. We can't think of anything else. Industrial policy seems kind of outré. We try to make the education system work as best we can. But as we all know, that's a very difficult and complex task. Hey, you know, so let's double down on this bit that works. Let's stop fighting the trend. And I think that as well, you know, that it's not just as it were that there are certain people that benefit, but there is also a fundamental question as to what the alternative really is. Um, and the struggle to positively formulate an answer to that has got a lot to do with the way in which finance is able to say, well, we've got some answers, we've got a whole bunch of answers that, you know, this will work. Um, I think it is evident, I think, to come to the second question, the scale of the challenge this poses for democracy. Um, the complexity of the system, the speed with which it moves, the vastly unequal consequences in terms of income and wealth, um, the profoundly destabilizing effect that it can have. Like, evidently, it's a huge challenge. It doesn't seem to me to be the biggest challenge that democracy faces. I, I regard, you know, problems of global poverty, of public health, and of climate change as much, much more serious and much more recalcitrant. Um, in the sense that the financial side and the monetary side actually has obvious solutions. It is ultimately because of the constructed nature of money, a product of law and of politics, therefore. It is eminently amenable to fixes of various types. There are obvious power centers from which power is wielded, and those are amenable to political influence, whether it's the form of the Chinese Communist Party, or whether it's the form of American or European or substantial emerging market politics. They're clearly central banks are key actors in the system, and they are amenable to political influence. This is a lot easier, I would submit, than fixing, you know, how you supply electricity to a middle income developing economy. Like how you fix the ESCOM problem is considerably trickier, let alone the global climate change issue where materialities are involved of an absolutely massive kind, which are hugely problematic and difficult to shift. Um, so I'm not like, for me, you know, I understand money is a major challenge for democracy, but I don't think of it as the most serious challenge. And I think the fact that it has become the bogey figure that it has is indicative as it were of our inability to really grasp the predicament that we're in. Because if you think this is your big problem, you're in for a really nasty surprise, for some really nasty surprises. What could we do? Well, it seems to me, you know, that we need to start discussing seriously what we mean by central bank independence. We need to we need to do away with the bogey figure of the bond vigilante that lurks around every corner that is going to damage everyone. We need to upscale the IMF and change its agenda in various ways. These are difficult problems. It takes politics that no one has so far mobilized, but is it possible? Of course it is. And we can see the difference in the way in which you know, advanced economies, the freedom that they have within systems, uh, the current system and emerging market economies and low income countries. And there's no reason why we should not find institutional solutions for that. Now, obviously, that's just the naivety of reformist politics, but by comparison with the truly difficult problems of changing, you know, 
absolute poverty and and public health issues it seems to me like you know it's difficult but it's not impossible and we see around the edges very interesting developments like the responsiveness of the fed in the 2020 crisis has been like nothing we've ever seen the scope of unemployment benefit that was handed out not for long enough uh, still on unequal terms, but nevertheless, there was basically an extension of support to income earners in the advanced economies that's been incredibly radical. Um, and there are ways in which one can use central banks not to inhibit democracy, but to facilitate it, both for better and for worse, I would argue. I mean, I'm obviously like a passionate um, Europhile. Uh, you know, I would go down fighting over Brexit, but I nevertheless regard it as both instructive and constructive that the Bank of England basically stood ready to ensure that the disastrous Brexit referendum decision, as, you know, as terrible as I think it is, did not immediately result in a crippling financial crisis. Because that would have been the subversion of whatever we think about it, a kind of exercise of democracy by financial market veto. And the Bank of England had the tools to prevent that from happening. And it did, despite the fact that the Bank of England was clearly committed to the Remain cause. We saw the same thing in the in the ECB. The ECB, um, there was a technical referendum in Italy in the fall of 2016. Everyone on the centrist side was lined up between the then prime, uh, Italian prime minister. It was clear that if he lost, it would open the door to the you know the mess of populist forces that we've seen in Italy since. But Draghi's position was, whichever way this referendum goes, I will go on buying Italian government bonds. So, and what that does is to license the Italian public to make a decision without the veto of financial markets being exercised. Now it's conditional, it's not absolute, it's not complete, but both those are instances of the way in which a central bank can act to underwrite certain key moments of democratic sovereignty. And, and from the point of view of liberal, you know, the Davos set, this is quite alarming because both those decisions went the wrong way. But from the point of view of enabling democratic action, it's a little bit analogous to me to the bans that many countries have on polling for like three or four weeks before an election, because they believe that it's a source of manipulation. Well, financial markets are a kind of poll. And we have the tool with central banks to contain that. Now, this is, you know, tinkering around the edges, admittedly, but it shows you ways in which I think central bank capacity could be mobilized by a creative institutional politics to, to loosen the fetters the financial constraints put on democracy. It's no doubt that they currently do exercise constraint, no doubt that that is profoundly unequal, but that doesn't mean to say that this isn't a realm in which one can shift the balance here. Um, and that would, be, that would be my plea. Yeah, thank you. I think that's fantastic. Very nice place to suspend things. Carl, do you want to say a word about the 29. Yes, just a word, but uh, I mean, thanks, Adam, for a really fantastic discussion. I mean, I think it, it's been a very good way of distracting ourselves from the exigencies of the current moment to have this mm -hmm. kind of this kind of conversation. So, um, everybody, we're really looking forward to welcoming Adam again. Uh, on Wednesday next week, same time, same place. In other words, uh, a virtual meeting, a virtual gathering. And the topic will carry on from this one, and it is the pandemic crash, global political economy, climate crisis, and the prospects for change, a talk and discussion. So, Keith, I reckon we just welcome everybody to that, and... Uh, Hope we see you again, and it'll be virtual wine and uh, virtual cake again. Uh, <laughs> but maybe one day we'll meet uh, when this is all over. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Some real I, wine. I, I will circulate. Keith asked me to suggest some to 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 readings. give you some readings. So I, I will uh, in the next twenty four hours get those to Keith, and we'll keep it feasible yeah. for a week long uh, right. session rather than some gigantic screed. Thank you very much. Right. We do not normally go on this long, Adam. It's really a sign of how compelling this has been. We're normally very strict about stopping it after an oh. hour, but it's really been a really been a great thing. Been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, I look you. forward to, um, to more you. next week and to more yeah. in person at some point in the future. Thank, Thank you, Adam. You. Thank you all. Thank everybody. you, Adam. Cheers. Good Thanks night. very much. Bye. Adam.